sky zone, um, <laughs> virtually at least. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Maya Holm. I am the program and communications manager at Zero One. Um, we are an arts and technology nonprofit based in San Francisco, California. Uh, we run arts education programs, we develop public art projects, and of course we conduct um, creative exchanges. And so this event here today, I'm just gonna add a little bit more detail to what Misha was explaining, um, is a presentation and panel review event, uh, which is part of our American Arts Incubator program. Um, so this program utilizes digital and new media arts to address local social and environmental challenges. Um, as Misha mentioned, due to the coronavirus pandemic, we have had to shift everything to virtual. So I'm sure everyone can relate to this experience of living um, their life outside of the screen, but having to really transition everything that they're doing um, to more of a virtual space. And it's been um, a huge transition, but um, I've just been really impressed with everyone's adaptability and engagement uh, throughout this process. And something that's actually been positive that's come out of this is that because we're doing this virtually, um, we're able to engage with people that we may not have been able to initially. So to a wider audience and um, the participants of this incubator in Ukraine are actually from different parts of Ukraine. Um, so some folks are from Kiev or Kharkiv or other places outside of the capital, um, which is really exciting to involve folks from all over the country. So to share with you a little bit more of the context and the program design for American Arts Incubator. Um, so each incubator that we lead is, um, is, is led by a US artist um, or creative technologist who works with a group of participants in another country over the course of a month. So in this case, our lead artist is here with us today, um, Dr. Ellen Perlman. And the American lead artist uh, teaches a series of workshops that shares their area of expertise. So in this case, it would be art and artificial intelligence. And they also drive dialogue around how these skills can be utilized to develop socially impactful projects. So after the series of workshops, participants are split into teams and they develop essentially a project prototype or a proof of concept um, over basically 10 days. So I really wanna emphasize that this has been a creative sprint um, and it's really incredible what's actually been produced um, over this relatively short period of time. So today you're gonna to be hearing from these teams. Um, we also have a panel of experts who will be giving them feedback that they'll be incorporating um, into future designs and iterations of their project. And I'm sure that um, Ellen can also give us more specific additional context as well. So I'm really looking forward to hearing everyone's projects. Um, there's been just, I wanna emphasize an incredible amount of leadership from our lead artist, Ellen Perlman. Um, and I really appreciate the support that we've had from Isoliazia. Thank you, Misha, and thank you, Sasha. Um, and thank you also to the US Embassy in Kiev. Um, we actually have uh, someone from the embassy here with us today, Brian Furman. Uh, he is the Assistant Cultural Affairs Officer, and I would like to turn it over to him to uh, make some remarks as well. Thanks so much, Maya. Uh, hello, everybody. It's uh, so awesome that we were able to get together, at least virtually, for this program. Um, I'll keep my remarks short because I know we're all excited to uh, see the projects today, but um, I did want to say, first off, thank you to Isolatia, to Zero One, to Dr. Perlman, um, to our panelists, and to our participants for just outstanding work uh, transitioning this program from what was, like Maya said, supposed to take place in Kyiv to uh, a virtual platform, which, um, you know, is very different, um, but uh, from what I understand, um, we've been we've been monitoring what's going on. Um, that has not interfered with your ability to produce truly phenomenal projects, um, and uh, and I'm really impressed with the work that the organizers have done, as well as um, all of your work in coming together for this panel presentation, um, and hopefully sustaining your projects um, moving forward and continuing to work together. Um, uh, programs like the American Arts Incubator are really important for the U.S. Embassy, um, particularly because 
uh, art is a, is a language that speaks to a different part of the psyche. Um, and it allows us to translate really important messages um, and understand one another through a different, uh, a different medium, not just uh, you know, what the embassy is often known for, policy messaging and things like that. This is a new medium for us to, um, to share our values, to share our opinions, to um, share, share beautiful works of art and also really interesting works of art. Um, and, uh, and I'm really excited to see what you all have put together today. So I'm gonna leave it at that and uh, let you get started. So thank you all very much. Okay, and I'm just going to say a few words. Um, I, I especially want the panel to understand three weeks ago, none of these people knew each other. Um, they had a week of very intensive crash course um, about machine learning um, and all the things it is emerging to do um, and emerging that it can be. They had 10 days of their, they self-selected the themes, they came up with the themes and they self-selected the teams they would be on. And then across a seven hour time difference um, with two languages uh, of synchronous and asynchronous communication, these projects were born. So I, I, I think it's pretty phenomenal. Um, the second thing is I especially want to thank the panel who are really, from my point of view, world-class experts in what they do. Um, I assume their bios are listed, but I'll just say in very quickly, Misha Liebman lives in Brooklyn and works with Snark Art, which is, or founded Snark Art, um, which is such a wonderful um, organization using AI and blockchain. Um, Vanessa Chang, I met when I was in San Francisco uh, training um, at Zero One, and Vanessa at that time had curated a show I saw, Cryptech or Cripple Technology, which I thought was such a sensitive and well put together show, and I was really excited for her to be here. Jean Kogan is, um, besides a brilliant AI and ML uh, aficionado, goes back to 2015 when I met him in, our, uh, in an art hack in New York. And he's been doing some incredible projects with Abraham AI that I urge you all to look at. And Arif Khan is really a man of many abilities. I met him because he was working with Singularity Net um which is putting um ai into the blo uh, blockchain and also working with things with ben getzel with sophia the robot and other kinds of projects and now arif has broken off and formed his own company althea uh, um which is putting your personal identity and identifiers into the blockchain um it's amazing project just so so visionary um, and so I'm just thrilled that all of you could participate and give your very valuable feedback to a group of Ukrainian artists of who three weeks ago except for maybe one and possibly two of them knew next to nothing about machine learning okay so that's all I have to say and thank you to Izzy Lazia for the incredible technical support and to Misha and especially to Sasha who's helped me every step of the way with this process. I couldn't have done it without them. I mean, uh, I mean that very deeply from the bottom of my heart. Hello everybody. I'm very glad to see you and to meet new people and I'm very proud to be the part of this big, uh, big event for me. And now I would like to present our work. Uh, Sasha, could you help me with the presentation? Could you share the presentation screen? 
So my name is Svetlana and I'm from the team Isolation and Connectedness. And today I would like to present you our project AI Dreaming. Uh, next slide. Uh, the main idea of uh, our project revolves around social distancing and isolation in a digital screen-based and virtual world. Loneliness is often stigmatized or ignored, but according to a survey conducted with over 50,000 participants, 40% of the people aged from 16 to 24 often feel lonely. Next slide. Uh, so the goal of our project is to contemplate the experience of isolation and to show it from an artistic perspective. Uh, we designed a grotesque environment of an artificial world where a person can reflect on the feelings that it evokes. Next slide. In this regard, we created a concept of a place in virtual reality where the surroundings and sounds convey a feeling of solitude to the viewer. A multiplayer experience where the visitor appears in the crowd of avatars and does not know if they are interacting with a human or a bot. And the player can move uh, further away from the crowd where the avatars are chatting with each other without the interference of humans. The pre-recorded dialogues are so surreal that it creates an impression of being inside of AI's dream. AI we use to generate the dialogues between such chatbots as Replica, Cleverbot, and Mitsuko, and we integrated these dialogues inside the space so to emphasize the whole atmosphere. Uh, next slide, please. So for the proof of concept, we have made a prototype application with the unique movement mechanics, avatars, sound effects in a minimalistic setting. In the future, we're planning to integrate neural networks in the virtual experience to make the avatars interact with the visitors. And now we would like to show you the video recordings of the AI dreaming experiences. Do you think there is? I think there is something bigger than the universe. So this is it. Okay, so um, you know what we hope is that the panelists if will give. Um, critical feedback and ask questions about the mechanics and also if they don't understand anything. It's just very useful feedback. So whoever, which, whichever of you would like to start, please do. Uh, 
I, I could ask some questions. Uh, how do you envision uh, the interactivity aspect or the entry point into this VR space? Um, is it something that uh, will be available online and everybody can um, join it and get their experience? How do you envision it? Oh, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, we're planning in in the final version. We are planning ma to make it uh, the browser-based virtual experience, so that any person from the world can use uh, the VR helmet or just use their browser to experience it. So now it's like a app that we tested on some on our uh, desktop and we need some more time to integrate it in the browser and so the people from the web could use it and just sorry and one more follow-up uh so do you envision some sort of interaction within the vr space in other words these uh bots or people that will join the space they will obviously they will be you will meet them there when you join. Is there going to be an ability to interact via sound, or how do you f see the interaction between bots and people, or people and people? Uh, yes. And we were thinking that uh, the bots, when we will import, so the bots will be, will have ability to answer people so the person can type a message and the bot can answer it with the message and uh, it will be interesting to see uh, if the player can uh, if he's uh, communicated with the bot or uh, another user and uh, there will be a mystery in this mm -hmm. okay um, I can I can add something. Uh, so I found that really um, intriguing for the kind of depth of the expression of solitude um, and the kind of feelings that emerged from it. It felt um, not just isolated, but also alarming, um, disconcerting, and unsettling. Right? Like I. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of layers to what that experience of solitude is like. And I think that aesthetically, the kinds of, the way the space is designed also is kind of, it, it's interesting because it's expansive, but also feels a little closed in, which I think really uh, replicates some of my experience in a way um, under quarantine. <coughs> I do have some questions about some of the, the elements there that weren't entirely clear to me. Like the interactions and the kind of movement through that space I thought was really kind of effective in an affective or emotional sense. But some of these other more abstract elements, I, I wasn't quite sure what um, what they were doing. Like these uh, DNA kind of helixes and what they were doing kind of operationally, but also what they were doing kind of aesthetically. So could you talk me through that a little bit? Uh, yes, thank you for your question. Uh, the concept of the environment was uh, very, uh, very interesting to uh, design and uh, I was making sketches and it was from the first uh, on the sketches it was very minimalistic very uh, like you know there was no uh, things that you could just don't understand what what it has mm -hmm. but when we went to this development base we understood that there are a lot of interesting special effects in unity and uh, we were just like playing with these elements and trying uh, if they could give us some new, uh, you know, emotions or something. Mm -hmm. And we have found this form and tried to play with it. And we understood that uh, in this, um, in this uh, prototype, maybe it's not good enough, you know, maybe it should be more multiplied so it will uh, cover all the sphere and it will be like hair growing or the moss mm -hmm. and uh, in this part we had not that much time to experiment more than 
this forum, so we just decided to leave it like this. But in the future, it will be uh, like um, we will rethink the thanks sorry you broke up a little bit at the end there so i didn't quite catch that um i just want to add something um just oh, yeah i have this lagging internet sorry yeah i, I want to add something for the panelists um to think about that if you can think of any uh collaborators, mentors, or mm -hmm. community members who can contribute, or if you know any opportunities such as funding or resources or education for any of the artists, you can feel free to suggest that as well, okay? Sorry, Vanessa, I just wanted to That's pop okay. that no in. Um, I, I also had another um, follow-up question since we're talking about the world and the aesthetic. Um, what is the, what would you like um, someone to walk out of this having experience? Do you want to kind of really just hammer home the experience of isolation or is the, is the offering an invitation to a different kind of connectedness? Mm -hmm. uh, so if, uh, if I understand right, uh, we were thinking about like um, to make the person who is invited in this world to reflect the feelings with us. So we created this world reflecting on these uh, problems of isolation, feelings that we have during it. And we are inviting other people to join us, to feel and to become a part of this surreal experience. And maybe to have this idea like uh, uh, breaking from it, like to, to search for the answer, how to break through these walls uh, of isolation. Uh, we're, we were thinking about some sort of uh, psychological uh, effect on the person who can um, relieve uh, or, uh, um, well, to, to get this artistic experience uh, with some effect on Emotions. Thanks. Um, I have. Uh, I see the question in this uh, chat. Uh, how would you protect people from scam inside platform? Uh, I'm sorry. I don't understand the word scam. If anybody could uh, explain it to me. I would say bad actors is probably what they mean, like people who deliberately want to come in and ruin the experience for other people. Uh, like party breakers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We, we, we were not thinking about those people. I think we should think uh, because we have no idea what kind of security. Yeah, we, we have to, to think of something, how to protect other participants, yes. Okay, so Jean or Arif, if you have anything to say. I guess uh, I would ask maybe what's the, what, what are sort of some, some things that you'd like to add or things that you tried to add but couldn't because maybe some, some elements were impractical? Is there sort of a, a roadmap for, for the future? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, we think that we we have to improve the um, work in the future, and it uh, um, we should um, make a, a redesign. I think we we have to improve the design. We have to improve the mechanics. We are planning to integrate neural networks, so it will be more interactive. And uh, yes, we, we have some sort of the plan for that. 
So we have developers who are uh, ready to do this and we're planning to uh, make this project as an installation if it uh, can be shown uh, on some gallery or uh, uh, web, uh, web product, web uh, multiplayer uh, platform to just join and feel the atmosphere. Yeah, I think on my end, uh, congratulations on building this out in a short period of time. And I think uh, the narrative structure and the ability to build on top of this is uh, something that you're well positioned to do. So I'm looking forward to seeing how this project evolves. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I think we just need some more time, more more time to design all the all the strategy and we think it, we need some like few months to program all all the stuff that we wanted to integrate and to get more interesting things inside okay uh, Svetlana can you just say uh, one or two sentences about how you want to integrate neural nets into this what your plan is for that specifically well I'm not very good with technician part, but I can uh, invite some people from my team who are developers so they could uh, explain it to us because it's hard for me to speak from the technician side. Okay. So yeah, can I, one can, of... I, I can, for example, Alex? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Alex. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Hello. Uh, I'm working on this project uh, with the visual stuff and with the technical stuff. I uh, made all the, all the mechanics in the Unity and together with another guy from our team, we work with uh, artificial intelligence and try to integrate into this project. But uh, we understood that it's very little amount of time to <coughs> integrate a real IE inside the Unity. But I think it's a, a good plan to make it in the future. Yeah. Okay, that's that's good. Thanks. Because we, yeah, we uh, we have some uh, some stuff which we would like to integrate, and I think it will be very good. Okay. Uh, I would just also add that, um, in the blockchain space then that Snark operates in, there's a couple of virtual reality worlds that are out there. And especially now with the whole COVID situation, they're rapidly developing. And um, I've been part of uh, different kind of presentations that happen in a very similar setting as uh, your AI dream, where everybody shows up as an avatar and they begin to have some sort of social interaction with one another. Uh, the, uh, definitely pay a lot of attention. If, if there is ever going to be a communication between people within this space that is not just text, but also sound, uh, sound becomes critical and how you combine, like I, I thought your uh, sound in the video was amazing and it has this very, kind of uh, dreamy feel to it that uh, you kind of uh, swim in and but as you transition into some sort of communication that maybe gives that interactive element pay attention to the sound because in these uh, VR spaces that I uh, had experience in when there when then there's more than 10 20 people it becomes uh, kind of chaotic and uh, to they try to isolate it by limiting the range of sound so that you can only communicate with avatars in some proximity, but it's still difficult sometimes. So, but it makes the experience a lot better. You can manage it. Thank you. Thank you for noticing the sound. We have a musician who was creating these effects and we really uh, paid attention to the sound atmosphere that to emphasize the all the stages of this yes we were planning to have these limits of sound in it it is uh, should be 
really uh, like ASRM style and minimalistic and not being uh, disturbed by other sounds like chatting or something. And this is why we uh, put dialogues of chatbots recordings uh, far away into some uh, neutral sound uh, effect. So they could uh, be more like separated and not to, uh, you know, uh, not, 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 not to get attention, attention from other parts. Okay, great. Okay, so Misha, maybe you can um, hook that team up with the virtual worlds that you know about in blockchain and AI, and they can take a look at that and maybe talk with them also, okay? Sure. That would be great. Yeah. So I think we have to move on, right, Sasha? Yes. Okay. Conspirology. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hi everyone, uh, thank you to, for joining us today. Uh, I'm pleased to present you one uh, our project uh, named uh, David's World. It is our reflection on the research we've done about fake news and conspiracy theories. Uh, Sasha, please uh, make our video live. David's World Fake news and conspiracy theories on COVID-19 are spreading around the world almost as fast as the virus itself, and some consider them even more dangerous than the pandemic, distrust towards the government and scientific discoveries, as well as the human ability to seek out consistencies in random pieces of data, make people resort to certain informational voids, unapproachable to the information from the outside world, inside these voids, Bizarre new worlds emerge with their own rules of logic, regulations, and their own brand of truth. In this project, we want to look inside this kind of worldview and display how the degree of insanity and instability grows in proportion with the spread, circulation, transformation, and multiplication of conspiracy theories. Using unity and raymarking. A generative tool for 3D visuals we created a web application for the user to immerse themselves into the virtual space representing the usual environment for the conspiracy theories adepts. The music is created using the Magenta Studio, which is a machine learning library that works with mini data. The user is a visitor in this virtual conspiracy world and upon looking around, they can find the master of this space. It is David, the conspiracy bot built with Unity node based editor. The visitor may ask the bot any question and get an answer, randomly chosen from the preset list of responses. These texts came from our analysis of various sources on conspiracy theories on the internet. David actually doesn't engage in a dialogue with the visitor, it merely shares its own worldview, as conspiracy theories adepts often disregard every voice but their own. With every David's answer the space inside this conspiracy world changes. Every response from the conspiracy bot triggers remarking to transform the visual environment in a random, unpredictable way. David's looks also change depending on what it is saying. The textures on its face is a set of images generated by the AI tool Runway AML from the texts of David's answers, and the animation transition between single images comes to life through Artbreeder. Hi, I'm David, the conspiracy bot. Ask me a question. Why would you ask that? Can't you see the Jews? Zionists have organized and engineered the novel coronavirus as a biological weapon just like bird flu to design the world, seize countries, and neuter the world's population. The official story isn't the truth. Coronavirus isn't a mere accident. It is purposely being used to cull sections of the global population. It is being used as a distraction. It's a man-made thing. It's been put there for a reason while they test 5G. It might be for population control, to get rid of a lot of us, especially when they say that it harms old people. Look at these towers at night time that have been put up, then telling people not to go out. Listen up. 
because I'm about to open your eyes on a much bigger issue. Back in October 2019, at a conference called Event 201, famous scientists, doctors, politicians, financiers, and the public gathered in New York to let a scenario of the pandemic play out. That is, they simulated the coronavirus, where they predicted verbatim every step of what is happening today. One of the organizers of the event was the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The more the user interacts with David, the stranger and more uneven the virtual space around them grows. If the visitor stays inside long enough, they might find themselves in a space of total insanity. Thank you for watching. Can I ask a question? Uh, yeah. How how was the the dialogue generated? Uh, the dialogue uh, for this uh, moment, uh, we haven't built uh, some AI generator uh, for the dialogues. Uh, we are expecting it to be built in the future. Uh, for now, these dialogues were manually collected from uh, the YouTube and uh, other sources by us. Um, I, I have a couple of observations. So I, I love the concept. I think that's really interesting using the kind of immersion into a worldview and kind of building that world and responsivity to, um, to these conspiracy theories. I mean, that's conceptually a very interesting motivation um, that David kind of reminded me of, you know, the wizard from the Wizard of Oz, that, yeah. that troubling, I mean, the, the flat tone of the vocal delivery as well is, um, it's an interesting spin on the kind of alarm that surrounds these conspiracy theories. Um, one thing that I'm, I'd be interested in seeing you develop more is maybe some specificity around the texture of the world, right? So right now it seems like as there's more of a descent into conspiracy per se, um, as your text says, there's this descent into total insanity. But I think that there's really, that you can really press on the kind of specific nature of particular kinds of conspiracy theories because they often speak to very particular um, forms of racism, sexism, nationalism, that might be interesting to integrate into that visual texture, right? Maybe it might be a specific kind of news source or aesthetic of a newspaper or media platform. Maybe it might be um, video. I, I'm, I'm not sure what exactly, but I, I do think that there's, there's a way maybe that you can kind of, rather than having um, this gesture at insanity or mental health, which I think um, it's important to be kind of careful of, um, thinking about where these things come from and what's motivating them and exactly what they're appealing to, because they're very targeted in who they're, in what they're trying to appeal to. So I think, I think that might be an interesting um, step forward in thinking about this project. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot about your uh, suggestion. Uh, yeah, b because we have uh, had uh, not so much time for development, uh, but we consider it actually the building some uh, like instrument that may collect the visuals from the internet also, because there are so much like uh, videos uh, with those uh, like uh, collages, like involving like I don't know. Illuminati triangles or so, yeah. like like this uh, famous one. So uh, ideally, it would it it can be something that uh, generates uh, the visual um, based on these uh, like iconic, I, I would say, images collected from from probably even from Google images or uh, or YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be really interesting. Yeah. Hi. So I, I really like the the uh, demonstration. I just have sort of two philosophical questions. The first is, what do you do when a conspiracy theory turns out to be true? And by this, I mean two parts. Uh, for example, when tobacco companies said cigarettes do not cause cancer, you can see an existing power structure that is obviously lying and is interested in preserving its bottom line. 
well, let's say even second, uh, when there was a president of the United States, I think it was Woodrow Wilson, and his, uh, and he had a stroke in office, but they did not want the American public to know that he was not having a stroke. There are certain things that uh, account as conspiracy theories presently, but then later emerge to be true. The framework that you have taken is very definitive and judgmental on the existing landscape. I'm not saying that these conspiracy theories are true at all, but I think a part of art versus propaganda is for art to allow the truth to emerge. And I think if you open up the curiosity space uh, that also shows where the fine line between conspiracy theory and the truth is, that might make for a more riveting exploration of the question. The challenge with uh, conspiracy theories is it's a very difficult subject to take on, but what the World Health Organization did, for example, specifically with uh, COVID-19, has come under genuine criticism in terms of their lateness to response, their closeness with China. There's a lot of things that were controlled by an existing power structure. So I just say that, that that line, if you can find a way of teasing it out for a viewer, as opposed to making the judgment that this is conspiracy, that shifts uh, the narrative. So those, those are my only two comments, but I really like the way that you brought the viewer in. Uh, hi, yeah, my uh, comment probably is more similar to what Vanessa mentioned, where, I mean, there's a lot of bots out there kind of in this, like in a similar way, generates uh, quite sophisticated, intelligent content that is uh, artificial. It has nothing to do with reality. And now there's a bunch of ma machine learning algorithms that are able to do that. But I think what was interesting about your project is this idea that uh, you can also correlate it with some visual information. So as this is what for me feels very different. And if you could make it more effective, where as this bot starts generating content, that the visual information reflects it somehow. And you actually are, as a viewer, going to kind of enjoy the experience a lot more rather than just reading random text. Maybe it will feel more real as it becomes more visual. And how you uh essentially drive the user into this experience and ultimately take him to this what you call crazy uh visuals uh will be very important for this to become kind of captivating and a good project thank you like uh, yeah we were thinking about so i i remind the, the crazy idea that uh the some algorithm based on this uh uh, theories uh, will uh, find uh, not only not just the images but uh, but probably from this set of 3d models like for example on uh, from those for those uh, Masson triangles so if uh, if uh, bot mentions Illuminati so the eyes in triangles could fall fall into this space and uh, make it crowded and the user will feel uncomfortable yeah, uh, something like that would be it would be it would be nice and um, like really really interesting experience, I guess. So uh. yeah, maybe just to begin, you can uh, narrow the scope of the type of text that it generates. Like it, you could it could be thematic, so that you could kind of pre-generate some visuals or experiences and then over time you can because it's a much more complex problem when uh, the bot can say anything and then you're forced to create visuals regardless of the text so maybe it's easier to start with something more concrete uh, and then slowly expand as well thank you yeah, and I just want to um, add one quick thing. Alex, can you talk about what you were trying to do with speech and the environment? You know, how speech responded to the environment? I, I don't think that was clear. So can you just talk about that? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, for now, it's a simple, <laughs> again, I work with this team too. Uh, 
And uh, for now, it's a simple triggers, which you trigger, for example, we have a voice from David Aikhead, and this voice is triggered then environment. And uh, this is a very simple trigger for now, but I think in the future we can uh, we can rebuild it and make more complex, more interesting, and uh, I think find new, more uh, interesting ways to combine the voices and environment and the speech and uh, text. Yeah, so basically the, the text, uh, depending on the sound and the intensity and what was said, changed the intensity of the environment, although that yeah, was yeah, not so clear. Form, yeah, it's changed the geometry, yes, it's yeah. some of, uh, it's not so easy to do, yes, of course, uh, but yeah. uh, it's some of uh, the simple triggers which you have in uh, game engines, it's when the sound can change the geometry, uh, some kind of like, and... Oh, okay. Uh, because mm -hmm. I don't think that was very um, understandable to the panel, but I just or to the viewers. But I just wanted to say in the background that was another aspect. That's all. Yeah. Can I? Um, oh, sorry. Oh, oh sorry, Jim, go uh, ahead. Go ahead. I was going to ask, uh, like, what, what, what's the relationship between the sound and the geometry? Like, how, what kind of sounds produce what kind of, of aesthetics and visuals? Uh, so uh, we had a sound uh, maker, Yuri. If we, he's here, he might explain it with uh, Alex and uh, the visual part. Yuri. Hi. Uh, look, uh, I think Alex should better explain, but as I understand it, it's just the levels of the uh, volume levels on the soundtrack makes shapes uh, change in in the and uh, and for and some kind of forms change in, yeah. in in the space that we made like some 3d objects get bigger and smaller and uh, that... yeah 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 it's some like uh, easy converter uh, from the yes the sound waves uh, converted to the numbers and these numbers uh change the parameters of geometry of size scale uh, rotation and uh, verti uh, some vertices I changed their position and something like this. Yeah, and Vanessa, you were going to say oh, something? Yeah. I, I have um, a big picture question about kind of where where you'd like this project to go, right? Because if the, if the ending is a kind of descent into this enclosure by conspiracy, um, that feels like a trap. And so I wonder, you know, I think there's a way to think about conspiracy, conspiracy theory with compassion and to understand it as a way of trying to make sense of or make a really difficult to comprehend world legible. So moving forward, perhaps something to consider if this is something that kind of fits within the scope of your project. like what might opportunities be within this environment for working past that kind of enclosure, right? Like what are some ways that you might build um, kind of a rereading or getting um, rebuilding that environment and kind of getting out of the trap of conspiracy, mm -hmm. if, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, as I understood, so like uh, the, uh, give the user the opportunity to escape this, uh, world, but uh, not with uh, like uh, closing the app. Mm -hmm. This uh, game experience. It's an interesting question, and uh, yeah, and uh, I think it it uh, requires like um, I don't know uh, consideration and even philosophical conceptual thoughts uh, on how uh, we can, if we are deep in this conspiracy and this uh, fake news, because there, yeah, there is a term of uh, informational bubble where like the, no, uh, the informa any information from outside doesn't uh, like comes, comes inside. And so uh, the more information you perceive, the more this bubble is uh, like unescapable. Uh, so and uh, 
and I think uh, uh, we can uh, refer to the researches connected with uh, this fake news bubbles. I think there, is, there was a lot of research uh, about it um, about uh, after the election in the USA, uh, which, with these troll uh, fir <laughs> like firms and, and something like from the times where this term was invented, actually, the term of information bubble. And uh, I think uh, it's going to be interesting because this uh, topic is like, uh, is, is uh, trending right now and probably uh, more uh, scientific and uh, public research will, will be written. So we'll be following it and, uh, and uh, like watch and uh, think how we could improve uh, this experience in terms that there is not so, um, there is ex escape from this situation okay. with the hope for that. <laughs> okay, thank you, um, Team Conspiriology. And now um, thank you. we have to move on uh, to the next presentation, Sasha. Um, hello. Yes, yes. Our project uh, is uh, called uh, I Stand Up Here, and uh, in the center of uh, our study are environmental issues and uh, climate crisis. Uh, Sasha, can you show our presentation to the screen? Okay, thanks. So, uh, the name of the project uh, refers to the 2019's uh, speech of uh, Greta Thunberg at the United Nations Conference. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, during uh, our research, we discussed uh, more than 20 environmental factors. Some of them can be considered as uh, positive or negative, and uh, many factors uh, are controversial. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, all of them are important for the understanding of climate crisis, but we decided to choose uh, six factors uh, that we can work with, that influence our reality, and uh, that have uh, a visual representation, visual representation in images. Uh, these factors are fires and green forests, slums and garden cities, uh, deserts, and developed industrial cities. Uh, when we take uh, tag. Uh, uh, deserts, for example. Uh, I can say that uh, this spring, people here in Kiev had uh, experienced uh, a sandstorm for the first entire time. And uh, this is an example that uh, uh, climate change had uh, already happened. Uh, next slide, please. There are many ways and uh, languages to work with uh, these factors starting from mobile app uh, prototyping and VR experience to direct uh, activism. We discussed a lot what we can do as uh, artists and uh, decided to focus um, on uh, creating an audio-visual experience that uh, gives uh, the viewer an opportunity to see different uh, scenarios of uh, mutations of the urban landscapes. Uh, we used uh, artificial intelligence uh, GANs for generating video frames. We consider this uh, language of uh, mutations, uh, variations, and uh, deep fakes as uh, something that uh, describe uh, our present. And uh, now uh, Maria will tell you some details about the technologies we used in uh, our work. And throughout the project, we were using two generative art tools, Art Breeder and Run by ML. Next slide, please, Sasha. Uh, we read a lot of articles about the instruments we used and watch uh, Jen Pogan tutorials on YouTube. Uh, in Run by ML, we played with style gen training features to create custom images based on our own data sets. For data set creation, we used Python script, additional libraries, home driver, and Google Image Download plugin for downloading images from search results by query. Uh, for saving image transitions from Runway ML, we use Runway StyleGen Animations Master. 
Also, we used first order motion model for image animation for facial expressions motion. All footages were selected and sequenced according to the scenario that was designed collectively by our team of five people. And now we are finally ready to present the result. This is all wrong. I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. Yet you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words, and yet I'm one of the lucky ones. People are suffering, people are dying, entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you! If you really understood the situation and still kept on failing to act, then you would be evil, and that I refuse to believe. Thanks for watching. Sasha, please uh, uh, put uh, uh, the last uh, uh, page to the screen. Good. So we can go back to the Zoom screen now. Uh, sorry about that uh, uh, connection hiccup. Okay, so um, I, uh, uh, any, Arif, why don't you go first, because I know you have some time limitations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I really like the interplay of the generative landscapes combined with the creative use of the first order model to create the idea of uh, Donald Trump speaking through Greta Thunberg. I think the contrast there is very jarring and confronts the viewer to do it. I really like that. Um, it's just very impressive work done in a short period of time. So congratulations. I think the only thing that I'd add is um, the, the questions I would perhaps like to tease out from a piece like this and ask uh, you both is, where is the in, the, in the beginning of the slide, you said you wanted the viewer to go through this with a non-judgmental lens. Uh, the way and the scenery that you have portrayed is 
fairly varied, but the music is a little bit uh, dark. Maybe you could help me understand what your intent was with some of these images and choices and how that leads to uh, the frame that you had of uh, non-judgment. Does that make sense? Uh, I will, uh, thanks for, for the question. Uh, so, uh, during our presentation, we showed like a super uh, short version and it's a bit uh, manipulative uh, uh, because of editing and when we use uh, Trump uh, it, and uh, Greta Thunberg, in, it uh, will be manipulative. So, uh, when we uh, put it up a concept, we thought that uh, uh, it will be a, a long-term uh, installation. So when when uh, viewer just uh, sees, uh, spectate these mutations, and uh, we will not uh, manipulate uh, this theme. So uh, as there is uh, this part of uh, uh, non-manipulating and a part of manipulating in the video and. Uh, Yes, because we had the problem that we uh, can't uh, uh, create something uh, totally non-moralizing and it uh, okay. can happen this way. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I just wanted to extend the invitation to the team as well. Uh, I'd love to showcase this work because we work, we've done some work with the first order model. So I'd love to share this work with, uh, with members of our community, but also on our platform and I'll reach out to Ellen for more details to follow up. Thank you. So Jean, Misha, or Vanessa? Um, I mean, uh, I thought it was a very polished piece, uh, very well done. Uh, how how do you in terms of just uh, the full experience? You said that you see it as a longer piece. What, what like how long and uh, what's the overall experience from beginning? Like, do you see people coming in and out of this experience, or is there like a full cycle? How how do you envision it? Uh, basically, it uh, depends. Uh, uh, on the number of materials that we have, and uh, we have uh, uh, a lot, uh, uh, many more uh, materials that uh, we showed. So uh, we think it uh, it needs uh, some time for for a viewer to come to his own uh, thoughts about uh, these uh, mutations, and uh, I don't know for for a certain amount of time, but uh, it takes uh, some time. I think maybe over five minutes. So I think we uh, we will have a chance to uh, uh, to put uh, an exhibition. So maybe we we will have a chance to experiment with this uh, lens of uh, of the video. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I agreed that it it felt very sort of punching, like in, um, emotional quality. I, I think the juxtaposition. Uh, of the the voice to the face was was really striking. Um, I'm curious, kind of, um, you know, with whom it's is it trying to communicate? Is there some kind of like a, a targeted audience of uh, uh, you know, in terms of you know what what are, are you trying to change people's minds on on issues or or is it something different? Uh, Nikita, can you uh, ask please? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for the question. I think it's uh, really important for us to be as a mediator of uh, this kind of serious topic, even if we would use like attractive forms like uh, this uh, funny deep fakes uh, in a way, of course, because uh, it's uh, actually one of the reactions we can see when viewing the these frames. It's a smile on your face, but then it goes more serious and this is uh, the way it should work as as i think it uh, i think we as a team also agreed so like the full scenario like uh, the um, uh, of a, of a for a visitor that would be attracted by a uh, interesting and 
maybe even funny in a way uh, form but then uh, through description through artist talk through maybe some other public discussions around the art piece it could go deeper through uh, to understanding what are environmental issues how to work with them and where to get more information and stuff like this so it's uh, actually quite a broad audience it could affect and uh, during this work we discovered that we uh, uh, can't be neutral to this topic and it's a very interesting uh, experience because uh, Arif asked about uh, this uh, <coughs> non-moralizing stuff and uh, uh, we can't be uh, super neutral to this because we uh, uh, just uh, in the center of this uh, crisis and we uh, feel it for for uh, by ourselves in our environment and if you allow just one more uh, comment regarding the um, audience it would be great to um, maybe to also uh, be shown for political um, for politicians and maybe this kind of um, deep fake form could uh, even uh, allow us to to be shown to even uh, or Trump or surrounding or Greta Thunberg or I don't know where can can it go but uh, actually I think the art could uh, make uh, such a political statement too in in terms of environmental issues that is the definitely thing we we could work with as artists um i i will um add to what the other panelists have said that it, and concur it's very striking the imagery is um very powerful and that contrast of trump speaking greta thunberg's words it's frankly a relief after <laughs> listening to what trump has to say uh, my question is about kind of how you theorize time and speculation in this piece. So on one hand, you've got the present, you've got Trump and you've got Greta Thunberg as kind of representatives of the present. And it seems like you're offering um, two different pathways, right? By merging these images of forests and trees and cities burning. Um, there's a way in which you're speculating on the future and kind of speculating on the world that is to come. And um, as Arif mentioned, there's this apocalyptic tone to it. And so I wonder how, what the kind of opportunity might be for speculating even further with the technologies that you're using, right? Like if you're in some sense positing where we might go from this present, kind of even beyond that, how might you use these um, deep fakes and machine learning technologies to envision something even beyond that or envision some kind of alternative uh, yeah Vitaly can I uh, uh, yes yes uh, yeah it's really it's really interesting how inspiring those images from AI from GANs could be like uh, in working and playing with uh, with this uh, we also found some interesting form that uh, are speculating with future or maybe in our uh, our interpretation it works this way like for example we found this flying uh, cities as uh, images as a uh, huge vehicles flying through like desert uh, like uh, as and uh, it also provokes the uh, lots of questions like how cities or communities could migrate and when there are some climate crisis what could it work in terms of adaptation to climate changes what kind of uh, forms like natural forms combine, for example, like um, animal genes and architecture in gun creates a new kind of architecture. So it's, it's definitely a vector to investigate through AI and arts. Okay, so thank you. Um, and now we go to our final presentation, which is completely different from everything you've been seeing so far. So our team mudra.
Hi, I'm going to share my screen to uh, start our presentation. Let me just make sure that you can hear it. Okay, that's great. I hope you can see it fine. Um, I'm, pr I'm proud to present uh, our team's work. The name of our project is Mudra. And uh, we gathered around the idea of using uh, biometrical data and machine learning uh, for inclusive arts. We decided that we would use neural networks uh, to make the machine recognize the gesture of sign language uh, through webcam and create a sort of universal translator into a different mode of expression, into text, voice, music, and visual output. We decided to start with Ukrainian sign language because there is no such product on our market today. And aside of ASL, there is very little work done with inclusive art projects that have uh, sign language at their core. The name we chose, Mudra, uh, comes from the ritual gesture in Hinduism, Jainism, and Buddhism, which helps to manage energy flows and balance. There is a whole set of those mudras, and some of our team members have tried them out, and they have been really enjoying them. And in Ukrainian, the word mudra means wise, and we thought it would be a very clever pun on uh, naming a smart technology that makes use of gestures. That's our logo, and it's a 3D scan of a hand that would be useful for us in the further stages of development of our project. So we decided that we want to create a tool that would help people communicate and express their emotions. And of course, it would be most useful for people with speech and hearing impairments, but it is uh, an expressive platform we devised that any open-minded artist can make use of. We also thought that this uh, platform could be useful in education and because it's, you know, Mudra is going to be a tool that I'm going to show you very soon uh, that will use the basics of Ukrainian sign language in a gamified way for people to learn that this language exists, that it has a huge uh, expressive potential and that it's complex and that it will spread awareness about the, the issue. Uh, the deaf community in Ukraine has been in the focus of visual arts for a while now. In 2014, the uh, film The Tribe uh, premiered at Khan, and it has gained a lot of uh, media attention. It was viewed more than 50 million times on YouTube, and it really portrayed the world of the deaf community in Ukraine as marginalized and secluded. And we want to uh, take this issue into the focus of our project and uh, turn it around in a way. There are more than 460 million people in the world who have some kind of hearing impairment and 100,000 of those people reside in Ukraine. So we decided to look at the technology and what can be done. Although the computer vision technology has been developing since 1960s and a lot of ingest recognition has been done since 1990s, we really have found that it is since 2016 that a lot of ready-made solutions were made on OpenCV, TensorFlow, Keras, Python, and Runway ML, and also the Google Collab Media Pipe framework. We decided to play around with them. We found out some commonalities and tax specifications that are common for every app and every software that has been developed for gesture recognition. There are two to th 20 to 30 points on the hand and the ratio between them reflect the position of the palm and fingers. And depending on the data set, the machine will compare what you're showing to the data set and thus it will recognize the gesture. The information that we will get from uh, this interpretation of what machine uh, can see, we can later interpret in different languages. That's like a very brief overview of the kind of research we've been doing. That's our team members trying out different techniques uh, on OpenCV, uh, in TensorFlow, they've been working with Connect too. But it, it, uh, the main outcome of this research has been that it's very hard for us to make something like that, not in just two weeks, but even in half a year was very basic knowledge of what AI is and how you can interpret general information. We found out that there are three main approaches to solving the, the problem of uh, having gestures recognized and then put into different kind of information. There is computer software, there are apps for iOS and Android that are mo mo more popular because they are more mobile and the, our target audience will have an easier access to them because of the different economical and other restrictions. And also there are programs that use sensors like leap motion for just recognition. And that's where we jumped in because in our team, we already had people who had some idea of how it might work. So we 
uh, again, dive deep on the research. And we've found out that a lot of people have been trying to do the same for other languages. None of it was done for Ukrainian sign language and even for ASL, which is the most widespread sign, la sign language a lot of work still has to be done to make it functional. There have been apps created and a lot of them are dated to 2018 and 2019. So we are right on point at looking at different developments and uh, com comprehending them to make them work for uh, our app. So for the proof of concept, we've combined Leap Motion and Touch Designer. Uh, we borrowed Leap Motion from our friends and our team has been playing around with the recognition of the hand. And then we've created a modal in TensorFlow and other tech members of the team will tell you more about this. Uh, we've devised a menu that will help us transfer between five different channels of communication. So in Mudras, there are five different channels of energy, which are water, fire, earth, air, and zero, and ether. And for us, we've devised the system that will help us uh, change between different channels of communication, making different mudras. So say if you want to you use your thumb to choose a different channel of communication. Say you want to make your gestures be turned into text, so you'll touch your middle finger. Or you want them to be transferred into visuals, so you will touch your ring finger. And there is a short demo that, is, that has been already made of this program. It's very raw. We've just finished uh, putting this video together uh, basically this morning. Uh, so that's how it looks right now. There's a little reference window with two hands there, and then you can see how little uh, green hands with uh, green, bo green bone uh, indicators there are moving, and that's how we are manipulating the program. So the hands are over the lip motion, which is a little device. It, it's like tuna can size, sort of and you can play around with the music in the music mode and then uh, I'm gonna make it a little faster so time limit you can also paint with it right now you don't really paint with the gestures you pay you paint you're painting with one hand but we will work on making the gestures more detailed so that the art can be created in a more elaborate way and then there is a mode where the gestures are recognized and are shown in text. And right now it's just a few gestures. It's high five, victory sign, uh, thumbs ups, and rock hard. So the gestures that are universally understandable and aren't unique to Ukrainian sign language. And then of course there is the voice mode, uh, which we think has a, a lot of potential, but it also needs uh, the most work. Uh, yeah, let's just let the dot move there. High five. Thumbs up. Peace, bro. Rock hard. Peace, bro. Thumbs up. Yeah, so the work we've done there was really impressive to us, but also there were a lot of shortcomings. They've discovered that the lip motion works with only the accuracy of 80%, that the device's functionality is limited to the field of view, and also that there are very strict requirements depending on the surrounding lighting. So we thought that we would need much more time to develop it into a fully functional tool, but already we've seen that, that its potential is huge in the expression of different artistic abilities using various languages, not just the one that we are used to every day. So for the further development, the first thing we will be doing, and we have already devised a strategy for, is collecting a comprehensive data set in Ukrainian sign language. There are a few online projects that are doing it already. We will need much more data. When we do the uh, information collection and when we incorporate the machine learning technology into our tool, we'll do a trial run of a version of Mudra's live audience. We are already in connection with a few inclusive art festivals in Ukraine uh, where we might be showing the prototype of the project. Uh, then we, of course, want to add a reverse signal conversion where the voice or text could be con uh, converted back into gestures because that's, then it will actually function as a real translator, although we aren't pitching the accurate translator right now. It's more of an artistic tool. And then, of course, we would need to add uh, facial expressions and emotion recognition because sign language is a very complex system that includes not only the gestures of the hand, but also the way your mouth moves and the way your body moves. So to make it fully accurate as a translator, we would also have to add recognition of body movements and poses. And there are some local developments like tornado gloves and also AMSUIT, the different motion capture uh, technology that have been developed in Ukraine already to some extent too. And we want to incorporate them in our project to make it fully comprehensive. 
Our next step is Master and Connect Azure, and some of our team members are uh, more familiar with it. And it's very important for us to move from Leap Motion to Connect Azure because of the infrared camera and the ZDEP sensor, because then our work will be much easier. And of course, we want to involve the community, uh, the local NGOs, and do the trial rounds at, at art festivals to make uh, them more inclusive with our work. And we've already uh, figured out an idea of how to keep people engaged during the lockdown, because right now when you're at home, you can do a simple good deed and just uh, have the Ukrainian dactyl alphabet recorded, your name, maybe just a greeting. That way you learn the language too, and you're given back to the community because we can uh, create a comprehensive data set. And the pictures don't have to be too complicated. Uh, they are simple criteria that we've devised already. And we've already had one person do it for us. It's very simple and actually pretty fun. Uh, there is a whole alphabet recorded. I'm not gonna show all of it to you, but Ukrainian letters are also interesting just to look at. They are different from the Russian alphabet, which is an interesting fact we've discovered during our work. We've also made a promo video. Uh, Thumbs up. So that's the end of our short presentation. I'm gonna give it over to your questions and other team members, and thank you very much for your attention. We're looking forward to your feedback. So Arif had to leave, but um, other team members, uh, other panelists, please feel free to jump in. That was great. I, I really like that. Um, there's kind of multiple applications stemming from one sort of underlying technology. I love the, the, the multiplicity of the projects. I think it's an underexplored category for sure. Gesture is really interesting to me also, you know, hand motion. A lot of people in the generative arts community are really into sort of hand motions. Um, and it seems like all of the technology is, is there to do all of these things really well. You know, it's, it's not actually like a, a terrible, terribly difficult scientific problem. Like we have pretty good um, gesture recognition, hand, hand tracking and stuff. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see the development um, you know, progress. Thank you. Any advice you have for us or any sources you can point us to would greatly appreciate it. Um, how how i guess i would i would maybe just to ask first like how uh how good is your tracking right now is it something you're trying to to improve i guess anton can speak better to it he's been the one who's done all the hands you're seeing in the picture anton can you yeah hi uh our uh it's like uh, gesture recognition with lip motion, not very well because, uh, as we mentioned, it's uh, very limited uh, with um, uh, like with first of all, it's limited with lighting because uh, when when it's too bright, it can't recognize it. When it's too dark, it also can't recognize it. And um, when you have some signs like this or like this, uh, it can't uh, recognize it. So I am um, in uh, future develop development. I think we will uh, move uh, into the machine learning um, when where 
um, machine can like um, add uh, that points that uh, cam camera can't view. Like uh, it will know where it must be for like uh, for better tracking. I think like that because now it, tracking tracking rate is about maybe 70 80 80 persons like so it's not very clear but it works like for now yeah gene i want to add that they, they're aware that there's a google api with much better machine learning but they didn't know tensorflow and they couldn't learn tensorflow in 10 days to implement it so they yeah. they hobble together something leap and and um to to do proof of concept yeah, yeah. and also uh, this uh, google um, google stuff um their uh, gesture recognition works only on ios and android then they don't have it uh, with uh, web cameras and uh, stuff like that and it's also like a limitation because i think if if this, um, if uh, Google uh, gesture recognition uh, can handle with uh, web cameras, so I think we maybe we will use it. But uh, for our project, iOS, it's like for now, it's not uh, in um, in priority. It was priority to show proof of concept that we can yeah. handle. It. Yeah. Yeah, I, I used the leap a, f a few years ago, but now I'm a little bit out of date in, in terms of what the the state of the art and gesture recognition is. Um, there's a nice toolkit um, that I'm aware of that, that might be worth looking into called gesture recognition toolkit. Um, gesture recognition toolkit or GRT um, might be worth looking into. And then I see a few you know, tutorials online about doing um, sort of hand hand gesture recognition from the leap. Um, I could I could share a couple of links here. Great. So I, I know Vanessa, you have a time constraint also. So do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, a great project. I think there's a lot of potential here, um, and it's fascinating to. Um, see this come from the perspective of Ukrainian sign language. Um, I know very little about that. My question though is about how much um, much input or how involved um, people who are sign language speakers or people from the deaf community um, have been in this project and if, if not how much you um, plan to include them kind of moving forward because I think with um, assistive technologies it's really important to have that um, involvement because they're going to be a part of the community of users. And when it comes to um, sign language, my understanding too is that there's so much um, that's communicated beyond just the gestural. Um, so what are your, um, your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, for now, uh, we, uh, we have uh, spoken for a few people Yes, but um, it's it's very hard to, to communicate with all of them uh, uh, because of uh, COVID and uh, all this stuff. Uh, yes, and um, in uh, future development, uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, contacts with uh, teachers and uh, and other guys who uh, work with the uh, deaf people and uh, it's and we will like talk with them uh, later when when we will have uh, development process future development process yeah, i can have a little comment there so we've done the research on what has been done for the deaf community to get them more engaged into arts in ukraine and there are several developed projects that are creating content to educate hearing people on how to understand you people with hearing impairments, but also a few uh, music festivals have used the services of translators from ASL and, and music to Ukrainian and, and vice versa to get people more involved into big 
community events that involve different kinds of arts. And Sergei, one of the members of our team, has contact with a few regional festivals that are interested in our in our future technologies and in its development. And also, we do have a lot. Of, we have, uh, I think, 60 high schools and 30 kindergartens that uh, are teaching uh, USL. And it has been introduced uh, not so long ago. I think it was 1993 when the first class started in USL, and not just the uh, uh, the other variety of the language that was used in Soviet Russia. So it's been it's been a, a journey discovering how big the problem is, and a lot of work will have to be done to involve the community because they are very disconnected from the tax solutions that are available on the market right now. Thank you for the question. Yeah, uh, Misha. Yeah, uh, cool project, guys. Uh, um, yeah, it's something that uh, I have uh, zero background on. And so just, I guess, uh, what inspired you to do the project, uh, maybe is a question. And um, kind of uh, from these different uh, experiences that you're trying to create for people who are impaired, or maybe people who are not even impaired, but are interested in, you know, participating in this experience, which one would you want to focus on, whether it's sound or visual or some kind of communication tool? And uh, where do you see is the most need on the other end? Like, so in other words, if you're creating this as a tool uh, and you're talking to music festivals or schools to work with children, um, do you, which one, w w like, how do you see them using this? Uh, and which one of these tools uh, do you want to focus on? Uh, so hello, uh, dear respective uh, jury and everyone here. Uh, I will answer, um, first of all, uh, about inspiration of the project. So this idea came simultaneously to me and to Anton about uh, using uh, biometric data um, and gestures uh, to translate them into something. Because we already uh, had an experience with Kinect we've made a project so you can slide content and jump into and then um, jump out and so on so this was our like technical point of inspiration and um, then we started our project and uh, during uh, this um, lockdown and during this uh, project uh, i should uh, tell you my story i had a very strong experience of transformation it was about a relationship. I met a girl uh, at the 7th of March or 8th of March and I fell in love and it was so uh, pure and clear and perfect to me. Uh, and then, like, it was lockdown, she also lived nearby and uh, we spent a lot of time together uh, every day for 36 days. Uh, and then it appeared that she uh, betrayed me. And it was very hard for me it was a uh, heartbreaking. I was I get drunk for three days and I was near commuting, maybe even suicide uh, during walking the bridge. And I was screaming and crying like maybe for half an hour. It was very hard for me. I'm a very impressive person. But uh, then um, uh, a, fr a friend my friends um, helped me to overcome this and uh, also responsibility about this project uh, because I was involved into this whole stuff and development. And also that helped me um, was a mudras. I started doing mudras and uh, it appeared that this is a very powerful tool. And uh, so I, re, um, I lived through uh, ego death experience and I changed, I quit smoking, uh, drinking, I enjoy uh, staying pure, and I redefined my aim of life uh, to serve people with uh, limited abilities and uh, to use technology uh, for them uh, never to feel lonely and isolated. And I feel uh, so much more openness. And uh, this is uh, the driver uh, by this moment. So it come all together somehow and uh, our aim uh, now is to develop the project and for sure to involve uh, the community 
and uh, to share these tools and to ask them uh, what, uh, how they want to use it. And uh, then we will adopt uh, uh, from their needs uh, using uh, this technology we know. So uh, how we want to use it? Well, uh, as I go through all these softwares, they are very slow, like it took a lot of time for translation. So we're looking for suggestions to make it much more faster. So like you can communicate uh, to make people uh, feel um, all uh, um, like uh, um, they have co com uh, they have equal uh, rights and equal uh, abilities. So this is our aim. And uh, it could be used as entertaining tool. So this is good point uh, that uh, people can learn sign language uh, during like entertainment and it could be used for education. Also, it could be used uh, with a projection uh, for some installations and so on. So uh, this is how we would like to develop it. Um, um, so we'd like to separate like this project based on Leap Motion or maybe Kinect, a next one based on Azure and much more um, accurate, accurate tracking. And for sure, maybe it will take for half a year to make a better product using ML. So this is our aim uh, for this moment, thanks. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for sharing your story. Because a lot of times um, uh, in our studio, we're working with artists that have various types of inspirations and some are practical, some are emotional. And uh, it's important to understand where uh you know it's coming from and in terms of just this this seems like a very like practical type of uh implementation uh it has a lot of creative potential but in terms of practical aspect uh, again it's kind of we, we also have to deal with it uh, at uh, our studio ultimately who is the end user and identifying them and making sure that um like uh, the tool reflects their needs or their interests. And, you know, this type of question is sometimes very difficult to answer and may take time, but uh, I, it's an important one because it's, you know, oftentimes we find that we sometimes create things that we think are very useful, but may not be. And uh, somebody else then redefines what we're created. And uh, this is kind of where uh, it kind of evolves. So in this particular case, since it's such a kind of very interactive, useful tool. I think it's important to understand uh, who is the ultimate user and kind of reflect their needs inside it. Yeah, sure. Thanks. If I may add to that as well, I think there's um, when it comes to working with um, the deaf community, deaf community, it's there's a really important cultural literacy um, element there. You know, um, I think that there's been a lot of advocacy and activism um, to di distinguish what they, you know, what people in the community say are little little d deaf and big d deaf insofar as deaf culture is a culture to be celebrated um, and honored. And um, so my suggestion then is in approaching um, people from that community to kind of come at it, not from a, you know, here's a tool as Misha suggested for you, but that we'd like to make with you and kind of really tr like doing that work to recognize that this is um, another kind of culture and another kind of language. And that's something that can co-develop and co-evolve together. Sure, absolutely. Even with just talking with artists and developers, our friends, we were just telling them that there is such a language as Ukrainian sign language. And for many people, even that is a revelation that there are a multitude of languages and that they are complex. And ultimately, if to in order to use the app, you will have to know some of the Ukrainian sign language because it will enable different functions there. So our thought was that we would raise awareness working together with those people. And you're absolutely right. Projects like that cannot be just imposed on people as our own vision of their culture. Uh, their culture has to be the source and inspiration for us to work for them. Because 
you know, we, we were talking a lot about who is the target audience. We were talking a lot about what is the format of the app that it should, it should be. Should it be something for a smartphone or should it be something with a web camera? And of course, we wanted to make as accessible as possible for everybody. But there has to be like a line drawn or where, where do we focus to make it most efficient? And we thought that we would focus on the language of art because then it's something that can get people together. We can get a mixed crowd in the room. They can all play around with it and learn. So, uh, and the, the crowd will include people of all kinds and people of different hearing and speaking abilities. And then if they can communicate through this tool to create art together, we thought that it will be something that can have an extra value. That's what our common inspiration for the whole group was. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our presentations. Uh, Sasha or Misha or Maya, do you want to say anything? Okay. Um, talk, yeah. I may, ha may, may I have a few yes. words to say? Sure, Svetlana. Uh, because uh, I'm, I was so impressed uh, with the story uh, that I heard and uh, the uh application and this te technology that uh, it, it's it's really great and i think that uh, there are uh really interesting things that you could do in uh, art with this technology like an immersive theater like uh, which will uh, get the visitor and the viewer in the scenario of uh, the theater play and it will immerse the person with these uh, functions that the viewer also can be the creator and i think uh, as an artist it's it's very inspiring for me and i was uh, interested in if you are uh, keeping this technology to for yourself or maybe there are um, like, you know, if, if I come to you with a project or a proposition as an artist, like, uh, hey guys, I have an idea. Let's get people together and uh, make some theater or, I don't know, music show or whatever. You know, because I, I like to make immersive spaces and I like to see interesting things there. And I'm not a technician person. I make concepts. I make some beautiful things that I consider to be beautiful. But this technology makes everything even uh, stronger. Sveta, you're welcome. Cool. <laughs> yes, I think, I think we will talk about it uh, later. Yes, yes, and about the uh, projects and uh, uh, evaluation of the projects, so of course, uh, we um, as 30 people as a community already, and I think this uh, development uh, will just only start from uh, this now. And uh, I think uh, we with is isolation and uh, with um, Ellen, we will uh, pursue the process uh, of evaluation of the projects because they are really great. And uh, you, f you see the response of our uh, guests. Uh, so it, uh, it has really um, good uh, future. And, about the uh, offline event, uh, there will be also uh, an event uh, after our our um, our quarantine. Uh, we will have community meeting, and uh, uh, you will have will, you will be free to um, express yourself to the public and to uh, talk with each other about your project and pre present them uh, in uh, uh, isolation. So this is, thank you very much all and uh, for your work and uh, for your sleepless nights and for your uh, creativity that will really grow and will uh, change uh, lives as we see. Yeah, and I just want to say, I know it's um, almost three o'clock here in New York. So I just want to first thank our panelists, who are Jean, Misha, and Vanessa. And if you can think of any other connections or collaborations to help um, these projects grow, you can certainly contact me with it. 
I, th I think we're going to stay online a little longer so you don't have to feel obligated to that to do that because um, we, the, we, we, this will be our last great meeting together. And if we were at a, at a show, uh, we would go out all to dinner, you know, now, and we, we, we are all virtual. So, you know, the, the participants have asked for a little extra time, but that does not include you panelists, uh, unless you want to, but you know, we know your time is valuable. So I just wanted to say that before Maya or, or anyone else had something to say. Uh, yeah, I probably will have to jump off, but uh, I think the presentations have been uh, quite strong and uh, I really enjoyed it. And uh, to the extent that I could think of different uh, tools or um, uh, platforms that are out there that are connected to some projects. Uh, I welcome anybody to contact me directly or through Ellen, and I would be happy to consult or just to talk about it. Thank the you. same. I, I also have to go, but um, it's been wonderful seeing what you've come up with in such a short time. I'm very, very impressed. And I will think further about any kinds of connections, opportunities, collaborations, and I will share them with Ellen. Um, I also invite you to reach out to me if you'd like to speak further. I'm happy to, to, yeah. to do so. Thank you. Bye. Hi, bye, bye Misha. Yeah, so. and, and just really, really briefly, um, I know we're almost at three o'clock, but I just wanted to chime in that it's been incredible just to see how digital collaboration is possible in this moment of us being physically isolated. I think um, when Ellen and I were discussing what it means to do team projects, there's a lot of questions. Is it possible? How is it possible? Um, especially with a group of people who had just met very recently. Um, but I think one of the most um, interesting aspects of this program is that it's so interdisciplinary that everyone brought their unique strengths to the teams and that was really visible in each of the projects, um, especially just seeing how things were answered to um, for with team members just bouncing off of each other. Um, and so I was just incredibly surprised at all the different directions that the projects went in and and really um, impressed by each of them. So I just want to thank all of the participants for your engagement and for your incredible hard work. Yeah, and th and thank you, Maya, for you know being part of Zero One in American Arts Incubator um, that allowed this to happen. You know, we're really grateful for that. And as you can see, there's a tremendous amount of enthusiasm to move forward and keep collaborating. And that's something uh, some of us are all going to have to talk about. Um, in larger initiatives, which I know I've been speaking to you a little bit about, I've been speaking to um, Sasha about, you know, we're, we're, we're going to try our best to continue depending on the state of the world and depending on different organizational bodies, for sure. <laughs>